morning and welcome to worship this morning at Overice Reformed Church. Just a couple of things before we get rolling here this morning, some updates. Uh, I want to remind everybody of the uh, event coming up on May 3 where we're having Chad Creevy come. Uh, he was in the, the 22nd story of the South Tower when it was hit by the plane and he's coming to account his story, to recount his story for us. And uh, it'll be an interesting morning. So on the morning of May 3, if you're able, sign up on the sign-up sheet. Uh, there's still some lines left yet, so you can, you can get in uh, this Sunday and next Sunday, and then the sign-up will be shut. Uh, just some updates on some of our members. Uh, you've seen uh, emails this week about Remy Boovey, little Remy Boovey. She is beginning to show some improvement. And so keep the prayers going for her, and also for my brother Tim, you've seen uh, emails on that. He has been moved to St. Mary's in Grand Rapids. Uh, he is undergoing a hemodialysis continuously throughout the day to try to get his kidneys going again. He is showing some improvement, and uh, we are thankful for that, so keep the prayers going for him too. And then I would... Uh, 
like to inform you about Oroville and Marilyn Essink. Uh, they have contracted COVID and they are uh, battling that. Um, Orville has myasthenia gravis, which uh, precludes him from receiving any medications for the COVID. So it's a battle for him and for Marilyn to also have it and to try to take care of each other. So keep Orv and Marilyn in your prayers too. Add them to your list and uh, let's get prayers going up for them also. And then just a reminder of the prayer time in the back corner of the sanctuary after the service if any of you would like to have prayer for anything. And uh, just keep all those listed in the bulletin in your prayers also. Having said and done all that, Let's begin our worship this morning of our great God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And with that in mind, coming past Easter, knowing what our Lord and Savior has done for us, we can come this morning and sing praises to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords and sing holy, holy, holy to him. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning and our hearts are filled with joy and with gladness and with anticipation about what you have for us here in this service this morning. We have been reminded of those already this morning who were in need of our prayers, and there are many more who were not mentioned. But Lord, we come this morning knowing that you are Lord of lords and King of kings, and that we come here this morning to give you the praise and the worship that is due your name and only you. So help us to put aside all distractions we may have this morning and help us to focus on praising you and giving you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and greet one another and then we're going to sing to that King of Kings.
and our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ.
Oh my goodness, what beautiful music this morning. From the opening note to the choir anthem and that wonderful focus on the holiness of God and the greatness of God. Look at us here. Who would think that God would reach down and save the likes of us? Men and women, boys and girls, young and old, all ethnicities, all economic realities, gathered in to the kingdom of God to worship the Lord Most High. We love children in our worship services, don't we? They can come in great number because Jesus bounced them on his knee and carried them on his hip. The disciples said at one time, Master, do we want to tell these parents to take their children away? And Jesus said, Let the children come to me, for to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. I don't know if you saw it this morning, but right around the 7 o'clock hour, a rainbow appeared over Lake Michigan. It was a glorious sight, and at first blush, I could see about one-third of the rainbow, and I said, Lord, I'd love to follow it all the way to the other end of the spectrum, and a couple minutes later, some light clouds dispersed, and I could see this whole vivid rainbow of God, and then... I said, Lord, this is beautiful. And it was though he said to my heart, you ain't seen nothing yet. And all of a sudden, the double rainbow appeared. And that was about one quarter of that second rainbow. 
and he didn't give me the rest of that one. But we don't always get answers to our prayers entirely. But he's there. He's behind every cloud. He's showing the glory of his name. And all I could think about as I saw that rainbow was his remarkable promise after the flood. Listen to this from Genesis 9, 12 and following. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. That's what God's rainbow is telling us. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. All praise be to God our King. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that creation bears witness to your majesty every single day. How we thank you that you are beyond what science can conceive. And though science gives us so many good gifts because you invented it, still, no subject matter that humans have ever endeavored to pursue can exhaust the inexhaustible, can contemplate the one who is beyond full contemplation, to explore the depths of eternity from the banks of time. There is an oceanic eternity behind us, around us, and waiting for us who know Jesus Christ. And we turn our hearts heavenward to you, the giver of all gifts. We turn our hearts to the cross at Calvary and then to the empty tomb. And we must not ever forget the manger. And as we think of Christianity and the nature of our faith, we bind ourselves to the strong name of Jesus and his manger, cross, and resurrection. We bless you, Lord Jesus, that through this great triumphant victory, we have the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life in you. Hallelujah. And we thank you for the bow in the clouds, O God, reminding us of your covenant of preservation to preserve the earth while the kingdom plan is unfolding hour by hour until the return of Christ. And though you promise never to flood the earth again and destroy all humanity, we do hear in both Old and New Testament teaching that you will judge humanity again in the flame of fire that will descend with the coming of Jesus Christ. So, this worship service is simply preparation for eternity. Another moment, another slice in the toaster of time to delight in and to eat and to realize, oh God, that you're coming again. And every peccadillo sin, every little creeping vine of sin that wants to snake around our soul like the great serpent of old Leviathan, we reject and renounce in the name of Jesus Christ. His cross has axed to death the serpent and his slithering power. And we come in full freedom of the gospel today as your worshiping community, dear God. And we want to pray for our brothers and sisters this morning, Lord, and we do. We thank you for Dave and Carrie Booby and their celebration over their child, Justin, who was married yesterday. We celebrate with them. We thank you that Lori Lubbers is on the mend. And we thank you that Gary and Barb Peters can restart their juvenile detention center, all in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we continue to pray for sweet little dear Remy Boovy and ask you to keep bringing healing to that body. Make her a fighter. Stand by her whole family and may the hundreds and even thousands of prayers lift it up. Bring much healing this Lord's Day to her body. We pray the same for Tim Kleinhexel, Pastor Ken's brother. We thank you for improvement, but we're still on guard praying regularly for Tim's improvement Lord Jesus. 
And we heard this morning about Orv and Marilyn Essink, Lord, both with COVID, Orv with his disease. Oh, God, have mercy on them and their family. May your presence be palpable, tangible. May what Paul writes in the fourth of Philippians, the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard like a sentry over a Roman castle, their minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we praise you for the church around the world, seven days or so removed from Easter and Holy Week, and here we are again living the normal life you've called us to live. Help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to humble ourselves before you, and may our faith once again find its exclusive resting place in the all-sufficient, sacrificial, atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand together as a congregation and we'll sing 405, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Amen to that. I hope when you sing that song, He Died for Me, it's true of you. That your heart has found in this world of many substitute offerings of life and happiness and joy that you have found in Jesus Christ the only resting place, the only true joy. And maybe like Solomon, you've tried everything under the sun, everything under the sun, and left nothing out. And you say to yourself, it's all vanity. Well, Jesus Christ is anything but vanity. They thought on that Friday they crucified him that he would be but a vapor of existence and time. And on Sunday, the disciples and soon the rest of the world discovered the difference. Jesus Christ is the only joy in this life. J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself third. That's where true joy is found in. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of your Son. We come needy and desperate for you. We have been exposed to so much in the last week that would want to drag us away and entice us away from Christ. And we come to a Christian church like this to hear again the good news of your grace in Jesus, that you died and you rose and were forgiven, hallelujah. 
But now we want to be fed. We want to be like little birds craning upward with beak open, waiting for mama to drop in juicy, plump, nutritious worms and crickets and whatever else birds eat. God, we need you. We need you to feed us. And if we are not needy and we are not desperate, then we are smug and self-righteous. Break that spirit. Cancel it. You must increase. We must decrease. And the amazing thing about spiritual truth is that as we decrease, joy and peace and hope and everything else increases. As you get the glory and we walk in humility and purity of heart before you. So come, Holy Spirit, minister this word to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I invite you to open your Bible to John chapter 8, verses 21 through 30. Here, Jesus will continue a conversation that has been ongoing with the leaders of Israel and the people of Israel. And he has some very important teaching for our over Isol church family this morning. So beginning with verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Perhaps you've noticed that many people today don't want to face reality. People really avoid the reality of different opinions. It seems like civil discourse over people who disagree about ideas and Matters of life and morality cannot sit across a table anymore. And when they do, they yell. People don't want to face the reality of different opinions. It seems like people don't want to sometimes face the reality that they need to make changes in their life for better health. They pretend to ignore what's going on and trust the Lord, even though He's speaking to them about making lifestyle changes. It seems today that people don't want to face the reality of our nation's founding, creating new ideas and promoting false advertising to the youngest of our citizens about how this country was founded on a belief in a transcendent God whose moral propositions would shape a future republic. It seems today that people are afraid of facing 
the reality of God's Word and its design for human life as God determined at the beginning of creation. All of this and so much more has to do with the human disinclination, aversion to facing the reality of sin. This morning we come to John 8, 21 through 30. Simply put, Jesus wants you and me to face the reality of sin. He is furthering his claims. He continues to declare his identity in the face of obstinance, in the face of people who refuse to deal with reality. You'll notice in verse 21 and verse 24 that Jesus says one thing three times. In verse 21, you will die in your sin. In verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Any question in your mind what His theme is right here? The truth we're going to pursue this morning like a bloodhound chasing a fox in the wood at night is this. If you refuse and reject Jesus Christ, you will die in your sin. These words come from the Most High God through His Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is using a very strong threat Jesus is using the teaching tool, if you will, of warning about the future. And in a day and culture where so many of our young people are frightened by anyone who disagrees with them, I submit to you the pathway of Jesus Christ, who came into this world full of love and light to dispel lies and errors, no matter how cherished or fondly loved or nurtured at the bosom of our soul. He came to reveal our iniquities so that He might restore our good fortunes. And so, if you or I refuse or reject Jesus Christ, Jesus says there's Three things that will happen in your life. Excuse me, four things. I'm trusting we'll have the time to cover all four. And let's look at these together. Right from the text, keep your Bible open. Number one, if you refuse and reject Jesus Christ, you will miss the reality of your opportunity for salvation. Verses 21 and 22. You will miss the reality of this moment or tomorrow to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Verses 21 and 22 begin with these words. So Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. In other words, Jesus is saying, This is your opportunity for salvation. Don't miss it. In verse 21, he says that he's going away. He's going back to heaven. He's looking beyond the crucifixion and the ascension, his resurrection, to the moment of his ascension. And he's going to be gone in a little while. And he says that they will seek him. But they won't find him because he's gone back to heaven. And as a result, they'll look for other messiahs who will never come, and they will die in their sin. And Jesus says at the end of verse 21, where I am going, you cannot come. They will never be able to go to heaven. In verse 22, they respond. So the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says where I am going, you cannot come? Notice they They heard his words, 
but they were clueless spiritually about the truth of Jesus' words. They lost touch with reality by wondering if he's thinking of self-harm or suicide. No, not in the least. Jesus speaks about the tragedy of missed opportunity for salvation. And I want to camp here for a moment with you this morning. If you refuse or reject Jesus Christ, you too will miss the reality of salvation. After Christ died on the cross, he rose from the grave. Amen? Last Sunday, we had an incredible worship gathering here. I think Glenda had something like 76 choir members, and we filled the house. The, the beautiful music swelled to the rafters of our soul and our heart. It was a glorious time. But remember that after his death and resurrection, Jesus then ascended back to heaven 40 days later. And as a result of his death and resurrection and what he accomplished by dying on the cross for our sins, he now makes provision for salvation possible for all who believe in him. It will be true of all who receive Jesus. It is not only a provision made, but a promise guaranteed that all who receive Jesus will go to be with him in heaven someday when they die. In other words, verses 21 and 22 tell us that Jesus went back to heaven because salvation has been accomplished. These particular Jews are clueless, and he says, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins and perish. And Jesus doesn't want anybody to miss the reality of salvation. Certainly not you this morning who have yet to believe in Jesus Christ. You are the one he is in particular speaking these words to this morning. That you might come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. The truth is, friends, no one has to die in their sins. Because there is a Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And to reject Jesus is to reject the only salvation the world will ever be offered by God. It is salvation from sin and death. It is then to die in unbelief in your sin, with your sin, bringing you down and down and down farther and farther unless you have Christ as your Savior. The tragedy of missed opportunity is what Jesus in his heart is speaking about in these opening two verses. Is this you? Have you missed your opportunity to profess your faith in Jesus Christ? The Bible is clear. Many people will miss their opportunity. Don't be one of them. John Owen, a great Puritan theologian and preacher, once said this, quote, No man shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight in the hereafter who does not in some measure behold it here by faith. And that is the key to salvation, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in what he did for you. Number two, not only will those who refuse or reject Christ die in their sins and miss the reality of salvation, number two, in verses 23 through 24, we learn that you will miss the reality of the two kingdoms. Now, follow along as Jesus continues his conversation and teaching with these leaders. In verse 23, he goes on after they wondered about his sanity or if he was going mad or if he was going to take his life. They said to him next, he said to them next, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Notice in verse 23 that Jesus says, he's from above and they are from below. He's not of this world, but they are of this world. Jesus is introducing once again the topic of the two kingdoms. 
the two kingdoms that are present on earth. There are some 4,000 religions or so on planet earth today. There are some 190 to 200 nations on planet earth today, depending on who's counting. But Jesus looks through all of that, and he says, I want you to know something. I want to simplify this for you as best I can, whether you're in first grade or you're at the end of life and you can barely breathe, but your cognitive abilities are still strong and you can hear this. There are two and only two kingdoms. And one is true and right and the other is wrong. And now let's try to understand what he's saying. In verse 24, he says, I told you, that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He's going to say, I am he, again in verse 28. That is a significant statement of Jesus in the Gospel of John. You must circle that in your Bible. Jesus is using God's word to Moses, I am who I am, several times in the Gospel of John. And he's identifying himself as, as God, as God's son. And he's saying, I am all that God has said I would be. I am all that the Old Testament prophets said I would be. I am the one who fulfills everything. I am the bread of life, the resurrection. I am he. And he says, in no uncertain terms here, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So in verse 23, he's introducing where he came from and where they are from, all humans. And in verse 24, he's talking once again that we will die in our sins unless we believe that he is the one God promised and God sent. Practically speaking now, let me say this. If you refuse and reject Jesus Christ, you will miss not only the reality of your opportunity, but you will, remit, you will miss the reality of the two kingdoms. This is what he's talking about in these verses. And you say, Pastor Mike, what are the two kingdoms? How does Jesus just slice it down to its simplest form? Woven throughout the Bible from cover to cover is teaching about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. The kingdom of God needs to be entered. The kingdom of the devil needs to be something we escape from and delivered from. The kingdom of God refers to God's ongoing presence and reign to bring about his son eventually to earth and then the gospel of Jesus Christ in this advent period until Christ comes a second time. He's rescuing people from the kingdom of hell, from the kingdom of Satan, from sin and death throughout this gospel age. And you must be delivered from this today. If you don't know Christ, you are not only an American citizen or not an atheist or not an agnostic or not part of some combination of multiple religions or philosophical viewpoints. You are either in the kingdom of God or outside the kingdom of God. And if you're outside the kingdom of God, you're not neutral. You're in what the Bible calls the clutches of Satan or the kingdom of darkness. It's very interesting to think that most people sense good and evil. You go to cultures around the world, across history, where the Bible has never been read or heard. They have a sense a code of conduct because the law of God has been written in their minds from birth and as God establishes that in every human heart and mind. We know that murder is wrong. We do. And cultures without God's word get these things about marriage and, and life and children and lying and cheating and stealing. They get it mixed up, but they know in their heart of hearts. They know in their heart of hearts, even though the image of God is broken. But Jesus comes and he helps you this morning put your finger on something you just can't get your mind around. And it's this. Why is there good and evil? Where does it come from? What is the nature of evil? 
Who instigated it in the first place? And how does Jesus and Christianity fit into all this? And Jesus Christ comes from heaven to earth and he goes, boom. He puts his finger on the pulse of what's going on in the world today. And he says this, we come from two different places. Now listen, Jesus is saying here, to the, not only to the Jews in this moment, but to us listening, we come from two different places. I come from above. I come from heaven. You come from below. You are of the world. I am not of the world. What is the Lord doing? He's not trying to throw a curveball low and away on the outside of the corner of the plate. He's not throwing a brush back pitch necessarily. What he's doing is he's saying, we come from two different places. God sent me to earth to die and rise from the dead. You are still in the clutches of darkness and sin that you can't escape. And so I have come to rescue you. I have the key to your salvation. I am the key that unlocks the door to heaven for you. And I can free you from all the sin and wickedness and evil and foul and filthy thoughts of your heart. Jesus clears it up. There's two kingdoms. There's two kingdoms. You've got to go down right now today saying, Honey, we heard from Jesus that there are two kingdoms. Jesus comes from above. We are from this world. Satan, the God of this age and world, who's the prince of this world right now, has reigned by the sovereign authority of God, and his leash is only so long, but it's there for this period of time until Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. And God is giving you an opportunity at this moment to jump into the boat of Jesus that will bring you safely to shore. The gospel of Jesus clears up so much about people and life and evil and violence and wickedness and what's happening right now. And I like to say this sometimes on Sunday mornings, but I believe it every day of the week. The most important thing happening on earth right now, right now, right now, and it'll be the same tomorrow and the next day, is when people share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody else. There is nothing that can compares with this. Colossians 1, 3 and 14 says this, for God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So God, friend, friends, is rescuing people from the kingdom of darkness. And we have that wonderful passage by John in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 8, which says the reason, now listen, the reason the son of God appeared Listen, the reason the Son of God appeared, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mary says, he's not here. The reason the Son of God appeared, 1 John 3, 8, was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy them. To cancel them. You see, anybody outside of Christ has a noose around their soul that's tightening more and more every day they go without Christ. It's choking them. And that's why it's less likely the older a person gets that they will come to faith in Christ. Because there's more sin in their life that's never been forgiven. Guilt and shame way down. Jesus comes and he simply puts the cross and slices through those cords and you're as free as you can be the moment he does that. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to miss the reality of two kingdoms. Don't live with this crazy confusion about, oh, what's going on in the world? There's a battle going on. And Christ's victory we celebrated last week should give all of us encouragement to enter the next six days with great confidence, no matter what's happening, happening around the world or in our nation. Donald Gray Barnhouse can help you with this. He talks about the resurrection. Listen to this. The glorious power displayed in bringing Jesus from the death is the guarantee of the physical resurrection for all believers of all ages, whose bodies have long since crumbled into dust. In the fields and seas of the world they lie, of whom the world was not worthy. There is the glorious company of apostles, the goodly fellowship of prophets, the noble army of martyrs, the holy church. See them rise from the dead because he was raised from the dead by the glorious 
power of the Father. See the victims of the Inquisition and the martyrs of Scotland's hills. See them rise like flowers thrusting up from the earth in springtime. Out of every cemetery in the world they come. No one will be left behind. This dust of the human body will come forth from the grave in the triumph of resurrection life. This dust, this matter, the chariot of corruption and the vehicle of decay will become a torch to blaze forever without being consumed. The chalice to the wine of eternal life. Hallelujah. This is the resurrection of the body, friends. This is your future. Bursting up from death, like we sang last week, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor over the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. If you refuse Jesus, you will miss the reality of opportunity for salvation. And you will miss the reality of the two kingdoms and go through your life in a haze, in a fog, unsure and uncertain of which way to turn in this world and die in your sins. Do you want that? Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. A thousand times no. To die in your sin is the worst reality that anybody could ever face. Let's go on to number three now. If you refuse or reject Jesus Christ, thirdly, you will miss the reality of the Father's message. Now, this is crucial. Verses 25 through 27. Jesus is trying to let them know something about what he's teaching. So they said to him, Who are you? Who are you? Do you sense their, their perplexity? And now even at this moment, maybe even a beginning trace of some kind of recognition of something other than they are. Different. He's a man. But these words, we've never heard anyone speak like him. So they go, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. In other words, exactly. Everything you are hearing and everything I am saying over and over again into your thick skulls is true. I haven't changed any of it. And then he says in verse 26, I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. So God sent him, the true God, the real God, verse 26. And I declare to the world what I heard from him. Do you hear what Jesus is saying here? He does not speak on his own authority. Verse 27. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. What you're reading here, let me put it real simple, in verses 25 through 27. The Father and the Son teamed up. And God, the Father, speaks through Christ the Son. They're one in this moment. Jesus spoke only what God sent him to speak. And if you refuse and reject Jesus Christ, you will miss the reality of the Father's message. You just can't say this is the message of Jesus. It is the message of Jesus. But Jesus had a, an assignment. He was on this grand, glorious errand. He would come to earth, grow up to maturity, and his ministry began with the anointing of the Holy Spirit out of the baptism, baptismal waters. And now Jesus Christ taking his cue from the Father, spoke exactly and only what the Father wanted him to speak. So you say this morning, where is God? Ah, there's so much bombing and bullets and lies. And Where is God in this world? What does God have to say about anything? You want to know the answer to that? Check in with Jesus. Whatever Jesus says, God said beforehand. And whatever God wanted Jesus to say on this earth, Jesus said it. So you're reading the word of God through the words of Jesus Christ. 
Now, this is fascinating because in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, we learn that human beings cannot hear the voice of God. Listen to this. Ten commandments have just been given. Moses is their leader. And we read, Now when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Hebrews 12, it's my next one, and then I'll make the application. In Hebrews 12, verses 18 and following, listen to this. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. That Sinai. Moses is Mount Sinai. Moses is law. Moses is thunder. Moses is wrath. Moses is lightning. Moses is the Ten Commandments. For they could not endure the order that, order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, says the author. So terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. That's Moses. Don't, don't let God speak to us. He's holy. We're not. We'll crumble in his midst. And so God promised a second Moses. Moses the two. Moses the second one. The new Moses, the greater Moses. That's why Jesus had a sermon on the mount, on the mount. He was the greater Moses. And what God did, instead of coming down himself on a mountain with lightning and fire and judgment, he said, I will send my son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will come down full of love and grace and mercy. He will speak my word right through his human vocal cords, right through his human tongue and human mind that I give him. So now I will speak to people, and they won't run for cover. Because I am the eternal God, the Father. This is God, the Son, who comes to earth to speak the Father's word. It's a beautiful thought. Jesus is the new Moses. He's the greater Moses, who comes not with lightning and thunder. Remember, the son, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That is reserved for his second coming, the thunder. It's coming. But this is a day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Do you know this? If you're not a believer, you won't know this. Let me share it with you. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time to come to faith in Jesus Christ. If you refuse Jesus, you miss the Father's message. I want to know what God thinks of everything. Jesus tells you. I want to know who really created the world. Jesus tells you. I want to know the future. Jesus tells you. That is God telling you through Jesus Christ. Up and down Moses went several times. And every time he came down, he told them a fresh word from God. Jesus came down for three years and gave us the fresh word and loaf of God right out of the oven of heaven, piping hot, ready for all of us to devour and eat. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And, and Jesus speaks heavenly truth. Jesus speaks about the reality of the past, the present, and the future. When Jesus speaks about creation, he's speaking God's truth. When Jesus says, in the beginning, he made them male and female, Jesus is speaking God's truth in Mark 9. When Jesus tells us about the coming judgment in the future, he is speaking truth from Mark 13, Matthew 24. This is our Savior telling us nothing but truth. He's not holding back truth because humans need to face reality. And truth is reality. Lies are not. I remember living in West Michigan years ago when our kids were little. 
And every now and then, after fall and snow, I would go out and walk with my boys or my daughter or one of the kids, and I'd make footprints in the snow. And they would try ever so diligently to follow in Daddy's footsteps. They would try to put their little feet where I had stepped because they wanted to be like their daddy. Jesus came to earth wanting to be like his daddy. Every footprint the Father gave him, he fit into perfectly. And every word, if you will, of Jesus Christ is God's and Jesus honoring the Father by fulfilling every footstep plan God had for him on this earth. Hallelujah. Fourth and finally, we've learned that if we reject and refuse Jesus, we will miss the reality of our opportunity for salvation, the reality of the two kingdoms, the reality of the Father's message. Do you still want to live your life denying reality or avoiding reality? Well, listen to this last truth in verses 28 through 30. If you reject Jesus Christ, you will miss the reality of Christ's cross. And only the cross can save a person. Notice verses 28 and 30 now. So Jesus said to them, here it is, when you have, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, that's the cross, then you will know that I am He. There's our phrase again. And that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak, here it is again, the Father's message, but speak just as the Father taught me. Now listen to this verse. They hate Jesus so much, they will see to it that he's crucified. They will convince the crowd on the triumphal entry a week ahead of time that shouted Hosanna to say crucify him. But notice what he says. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. They'll know something. And that I do nothing on my own authority but speak as the Father taught me. He's not saying the moment I'm hanging on the cross, you'll recognize everything. That's not, that's not Jesus, what he's saying. Listen. Jesus is saying, when you hang me on that cross, and they don't even know about the cross yet, but it's going to happen. When you hang me on that cross, it's about five months away. In the Gospel of John, when you hang me on that cross, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead in victory. Forty days later, I'm going to go to heaven. And so many years later, I'm going to come back and judge the living and the dead. And he's saying to these leaders here and now, somewhat cryptically, but fully in line with his truthfulness and his purpose, that when you hang me on that cross because you hate me so much, one day, one day you will see who I really am and it will be too late. Oh, you will see I am he, but it'll be too late and you will die in your sins. What a statement. And then he says in verse 29, and he who sent me is with me, that's the Father. He has not left me alone, the Father's with him, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is a, a preparatory kind of belief, I think. It's not that they believed in the full-orbed reality of Christ, but they're starting to trend in that direction. It's probably a preparation for deep-seated, true belief in him. Well, what does this mean, friends? Listen, Jesus is saying the cross, when you lift me up, will reveal who I am and who the Father is. And if you don't get it in this life, you will get it in the life to come, one way or the other. Jesus is saying, learn it now or learn it later. Oh, the cross of Christ. You know, if you, if you reject Jesus at the end of the day, you're rejecting the salvation that he offers you through the cross, through his resurrection. And you need to be saved. You need to be saved from your... You need to be born again. You need to be regenerated. You need to cry out, Abba, Father. And you can only do this if you let Jesus deal with your sin. 
In England, there are some beautiful gardens called the Hampton Court Gardens that have been around for a couple hundred years, I think at least. I came across a story that, that reminded me of the power of sin in a person's life. Listen to this. In Hampton Court Gardens, there are many mammoth oaks practically vanquished by the monstrous coils of ivy which entwine themselves about the tree's trunks like some monstrous serpents entwined about the bodies of their prey. There was a time when the ivy was but a tiny aspirant, asking only a little aid in its upward climb. Had the ivy been denied then, the oaks would have never become the victims of the ivy. Now, there is no untwisting of the coils, and every hour, the victor is rendering more vanquished its host. That's sin. Every hour you put off Jesus Christ, the ivy of sin is stretching and coursing around your perishing soul, and you have zero power, no power to free yourself from the serpent who's coiling around you, invisible yet real. Scratch somebody who's been without Jesus Christ for decades of their life, and on the surface you find kindness and civility, but you push them in the direction of Jesus Christ, or you offer them the remedy for their sin, and they get strong and, and almost act out against you because the cross offends them. I want my ivy of sin. Let it coil around me as long as it wants. If that's who you are, you will die in your sin. The great American naturalist Henry David Thoreau once wrote, and I quote, listen, there are a hundred men hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. Christian, you will never stop your sinning by striking at the sin itself. That pornography, that lie, that affair, that embezzling, that filthy thought, if you just try to eliminate it for itself, you cannot do anything about it. And unfortunately, too many Christians go about stopping their sin by trying to stop their sin. It'll never happen. You got to let the cross of Christ slash the root by the power of the Holy Spirit to free you from that sin that wants to coil around even the believer's heart and they say things like, oh, well, that's just in our family or, oh, that's just how grandpa was and I can't break. No! Next week, our, our sermon is called Free Indeed. Jesus follows up this with his great message of Christian freedom. The cross reveals God's love and the cross reveals our sin. The cross reveals God's wrath. The cross reveals Christ's sacrifice for our sin. The cross reveals so many things. And I implore you and ask you today as we close, live every day with the cross upon your shoulders to remind yourself that if I keep hacking away at my sin, I'll never get free of it. But if I but bear my cross... And I let Jesus every day stay close to me. And I die to my sin. I don't hack at it. I die to it. So I rise to newness of life. Is there an amen in the house of God this morning? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for teaching us, Jesus, as you taught them so long ago. If it's true that there are a hundred people hacking at branches of evil to only one who is striking at the root, may I be that one today, God? And may more than one, may a hundred rise up and say, enough of flirting with sin, enough of accepting it. I want more out of my life. I want a Savior who truly saves, a cross that, cru that truly raises me up from the dead, and a cross to carry for Jesus that I might live lowly and humble recognizing my susceptibilities to temptation and sin. And next week, Lord, as we learn about the joy of Christian freedom, may it even begin today with this great truth. In your name we pray, amen.
Amen. There is a Redeemer for you and me this morning. Let's stand up and sing about him in 206. Congregation, go forth with this blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and evermore. Amen. Go in his peace.